The history of Batman begins 1995 with Batman Troika and Batman vs Predator 2, both stories that began in 1994 and culminate in January of 1995. In that same month, DC published Batman Mightfall, a parody of Nightfall featuring Batmite and also Gotham Knights 2, the sequel to Gotham Knights. Both comics are very questionable publications, as Mightfall was only created to make fun of Nightfall, and Gotham Knights doesn't really have a reason to exist. Truthfully, Batman's year didn't start quite right, as in February, DC published the most experimental and quite possibly the worst Batman comic of the year, called Batman Jazz. This three-chapter special follows Batman as he tries to solve the mystery behind a jazz musician, but the concept of the story revolves around finding the true meaning of jazz as music and trying to represent that visually in the story. I really can't think of a worse Batman story than that. The beginning of the year was not quite relevant for many of the Batman comics, like The Batman Adventures, Catwoman, Azrael Robin or Shadow of the Bat. However, one title that did matter was Legends of the Dark Knight, which features an outstanding two-part story in issues number 69. Nice and number 70. The story is called Criminals, and it was written by Stephen Grant with art by Mike Zegg. In the story, Batman has to go undercover inside Blackgate in order to stop a series of murders. This is one of my personal favorite stories, thanks to a great plot, beautiful art, and excellent characterization of Batman. Speaking of favorites, the winter of 1995 saw the beginning, the proper start of the Batman run by writer Doug Mange and artist Kelly Jones. Batman number 516 and 517 features the first two-part storyline by the new creative team, where Batman has to confront a new and deadly enemy called the Sleeper. The great thing about Doug Mensch and Kelly Jones' Batman run is that it was the only Batman book with a distinctive personality. The art and the plots of this run are unique and unmistakable, going back to the gothic horror and pulp noir origins of the Dark Knight, a creature of the night who terrorizes criminals in a city of horrors. Their Batman is truly the stuff of nightmares, as it should be. However, and despite how different and special the series was, there were many readers who did not give it a chance and dropped the series entirely in favor of more traditional stories, like the ones in Detective Comics. In the first months of 1995, writer Chuck Dixon and artist Graham Nolan reinvented the character of the Penguin. In Detective Comics number 683 and 684, they reimagined Oswald Cobblepot as a legitimate businessman, and they created the now iconic and most exclusive nightclub in Gotham City, the Iceberg Lounge. This new Penguin ran criminal operations undercover, and his activities as the manager and owner of the Iceberg Lounge provided him with the perfect alibi to avoid being incriminated by his illegal activities. Chuck Dixon and Graham Nolan had already reimagined Firefly as a dangerous arsonist during the Nightfall saga, and now they gave the Penguin the same treatment, modernizing the character for the new generations and giving him back his dignity as one of the best enemies of Batman. The Iceberg Lounge was not the only landmark to become relevant in 1995, as DC started making plans to bring back the most dangerous place in Gotham. When Bane destroyed Arkham Asylum during Nightfall, all the inmates were relocated to Blackgate. The prison became their temporary home, until they could rebuild the old asylum or find a new one. This moment finally happened in issues number 37 and 38 of Shadow of the Bat, where writer Alan Grant and artist Barry Kitson created a Joker story that introduced the new Arkham Asylum. The Joker was one of the few Arkham inmates who had not been recaptured since Nightfall. Because of this, Joker made a couple of guest appearances in other comic books like the Wonder Woman series, before returning back to Gotham, where he kidnaps those who failed to laugh at his comedic routines before he became Joker. The Clown Prince of Death takes them to a big and abandoned gothic mansion, just outside of Gotham, where he forces them to watch his new routine and their only choices are to laugh or die. 
The story takes many elements from the flashbacks to the Joker's origin story in The Killing Joke, and it also has a great similarity with the episode Make Him Laugh from Batman the Animated Series, only this story has a much darker tone. Although Batman manages to save some of the victims, the Joker escapes once again. But when the authorities arrive at the scene, Dr. Jeremiah Arkham becomes fascinated with the abandoned building and decides that the place is perfect for the new Arkham Asylum, the new home of madness. Following that story, the ultimate zombie of the DC Universe returns to Gotham in Shadow of the Bat number 39. Solomon Grundy had only appeared once in the Batman comics, back in 1983, and now, 12 years later, the monster comes back to haunt Gotham and provide an enormous physical challenge to Batman. While Solomon Grundy refuses to stay dead, Anarchy dies in issues number 40 and 41 of Shadow of the Bat. The story features a prophet of doom, who seems to be modeled after the character of Nostromos from the episode Prophecy of Doom of Batman the Animated Series. When Anarchy tries to stop this criminal, he is caught in a big explosion, and although his body is not recovered, he is presumed dead by his family and the authorities. Anarchy may or may not have died in the main continuity, but around the same time, he made his official first appearance in the DC Animated Universe in issue number 31 of The Batman Adventures, an issue featuring Alan Grant as a guest writer. The Batman Adventures remained one of the most consistently good series in the spring of 95, along with Azrael, where the hero's journey around the world leads him to meet with Ra's al Ghul and Talia. Meanwhile, the Batman family confronted the threat of King Snake, Lynx, and a new enemy called the Silver Monkey. Together, the combined forces of Batman, Robin, Nightwing, and the Huntress managed to keep the gangs of Gotham's Chinatown under control in a three-chapter story that begins in Detective Comics number 685 and crosses over to the Robin title for the second chapter. Speaking of that, the Robin series was one of those titles that didn't have much notable developments in the spring of 95. Another one was Legends of the Dark Knight, which featured a very anticlimactic three-part story about werewolves. Then there's also the Catwoman title, where the only important thing happening was the reveal of Catwoman's camouflage outfit in issues number 20 and 21. Catwoman was also featured in issue number 4 of Showcase 95, while issue number 5 featured the spoiler. In 1994, the Showcase series featured many stories with characters from the Batman universe, but in 1995, Showcase became a backup series for the Superman titles. For this reason, in the spring of 95, the Batman team at DC Comics launched a new comic book called The Batman Chronicles. This new title would be published tri-monthly, and it featured three separate stories written by the three main Batman writers, Chuck Dixon, Alan Grant, and Doug Mange, all of them working together with various different artists. The Batman Chronicles became Batman's own showcase title, and in one of the stories of the first issue, they finally explain why Batman doesn't approve of the Huntress, and the reason involves Commissioner Gordon, his daughter Barbara, and a painful memory. Speaking of Commissioner Gordon, 1995 was one of the most problematic years for Batman's oldest friend. All throughout the year, Gordon had regular confrontations with his wife, Sarah, that resulted in them fighting and not living together anymore. To make things worse, Gordon loses the support of the Major of Gotham and is replaced as police commissioner by Sarah. Gordon then quits the GCPD and, in an unexpected turn of events, he decides to run for Major of Gotham in the upcoming elections. This subplot was showcased in Shadow of the Bat Detective Comics, but most importantly, in issues number 518 and 519 of the Batman title, where Batman confronts Black Mask for the first time since 1992. Batman number 518 is also the final work by Adrienne Roy, who had been the colorist of the Batman comic book for more than 15 consecutive years, which is probably a record that only she can claim. The fact is that in the spring of 95, DC Comics started experimenting with digital coloring, a technology that was slowly becoming the standard. The first Batman book published with the new digital coloring was Batman number 519, which was also printed in the new glossy paper. All of these allowed for more vibrant and colorful illustrations, but the price of each comic book went up from 150 to 195. Issue number 520 of Batman features an unusual collaboration between Doug Mange and artist Eduardo Barreto as they tell a terribly sad story about love and how painful it is when that love is lost. The story is called Fades to Black, and it is definitely the most poignant story of the year.
The spring of 95 also saw the release of the first batch of annuals. The theme of this year's annuals was Year One, with the only exception being the Batman Adventures Annual Number no. 2, which featured an epic story about Batman fighting against Ra's al Ghul with help from the demon Etrigan. Aside from that annual, the rest of them followed the successful Frank Miller concept to retell the origin stories of many notable characters. The Robin Annual No. 4 features an extended and modernized version of Dick Grayson's origin story and his journey to become the first boy wonder. The Legends of the Dark Knight Annual No. 5 features the new origin of Mambat in a story that introduces Kirk Langstrom as a scientist who suffers from hearing loss and who experiments with bats to find a cure. Although he is successful, he quickly starts to transform into Mambat. This is a more tragic take on the origin of Mambat, and the art by Enrique Alcatena enhances the tragic and fearsome side of Mambat. The story is heavily inspired by the episode on Leather Wings from Batman the Animated Series, and it is also dedicated to Frank Robbins, the writer and co-creator of Mambat, who had recently passed away in 1994. The Catwoman Annual No. 2 updates the origin of Catwoman yet again. The story takes many elements from Batman Year One and also from Catwoman's new origin established in Zero Hour to complete the picture of what happened to Selina Kyle during and after Batman Year One and how she went from a street hooker into a martial arts master and expert cat burglar in just one year. And the Detective Comics Annual No. 8 features the origin story of The Riddler, where Edward Nigma explains his own personal journey and history of crime during a therapy session in Arkham. The story borrows many elements from The Riddler's first appearance and it also introduces his henchwoman Query and Echo. In May of 1995 and as spring was coming to an end, DC Comics published a couple of graphic novels, starting with Nightwing, Alfred's Return. This book follows Nightwing as he travels to England to find Alfred after he quit being Bruce Wayne's butler during Nightfall. After a terrible and disappointing experience with an old lover, Alfred joins forces with Nightwing to save England from a dangerous conspiracy and afterwards the trusty old butler decides it's time to go home. In that same month, DC published Batman Riddler, The Riddle Factory and Batman Two-Face, Crime and Punishment. Though the concept of both books was to showcase each villain, the way they go about it is drastically different. The Riddler story lacks any sense of direction, the art is cluttered and the writing is very unclear, with mountains of dialogue and excessive exposition, destroying all the atmosphere and characterization. The Two-Face story, on the other hand, is a deep character study that tries to explain the motivations and the psychology of Two-Face. The story was written by J.M. DiMatteis, a great comic book writer, and this dark graphic novel is also the first Batman work by artist Scott McDaniel. These 50 pages graphic novels were released just as the summer of 1985 was coming closer, and the release of the new Batman movie was right around the corner. In the summer of 1995, Warner Bros. released the third chapter of the cinematic Batman franchise. The movie, called Batman Forever, was a sequel to Batman Returns, with many things changing between films. The director of Batman Returns, Tim Burton, was replaced by Joel Schumacher, while the original Batman actor Michael Keaton decided to leave the Batman franchise and Val Kilmer became the new Batman. Batman Forever became notorious for being the first live-action movie to feature Two-Face, as well as introducing the Riddler and Robin to the Batman cinematic universe. The movie was created with a very different mindset from the original films, as they wanted to have a kid-friendly franchise. The tone of the movie is much lighter than Batman Returns, a change that is reflected in the colorful images, over-the-top performances and bombastic soundtrack. Joy as part of the marketing campaign for the movie, DC published the official comic book adaptation of Batman Forever, which also included some of the deleted scenes from the final cut of the film. Batman Forever was released on June 16, 1995, and it was met with mixed reviews. 
Some people found the new approach refreshing, but many fans were not happy with the new tone of the film. Regardless, the movie was an outstanding box office success, which convinced Warner Bros. to license the movie to video game companies to make games based on the film. As a result, Batman Forever video games were made for the SNES, the Sega Genesis, the Game Gear, Game Boy, and a couple other consoles. All of these games followed the same formula. They were side-scrolling beat-em-ups where Batman and Robin have to fight enemies through different stages until they beat the game. The gameplay was reduced to very basic combat with kicks, punches, and the occasional gadget. For all intents and purposes, this was a fighting game, with Batman and Robin, with the graphics and movements even being taken from the popular Mortal Kombat franchise. The video games based on Batman Forever were met with mostly negative reviews, and none of the games reached the same levels of success as the movie, which continued to influence the comic books, as just one month after the movie was released, DC Comics published Batman Judge Dredd, the ultimate riddle. This was the third crossover between Batman and Red, and in this one, they have to work together to stop an unusually powerful Riddler. The fact is that, with Two-Face and Riddler back on the spotlight, DC Comics decided to showcase the rest of Batman's villains. For instance, Killer Croc is featured in a story where he escapes from Arkham Asylum and is lured into the swamps of Louisiana by none other than the Swamp Thing. This story from issues number 521 and 522 of Batman explain how Killer Croc slowly becomes more reptilian with the passing of time. The story also features the official return of Alfred to the Batman comics. Following that, they showcased the Scarecrow in issues number 523 and 524, a two-part story that is complemented by the retelling of the Scarecrow's origin story told in the Batman Annual number 19. Meanwhile, in issues 687 and 688 of Detective Comics, they introduced a new villain called Captain Fear in a two-part story that is almost too similar to the episodes of the 1960s Batman TV show, with a strange costume criminal, a deathly death trap, a cliffhanger, and an epic final confrontation. Following that, Detective Comics showcased the arsonist Firefly and his demented obsession with fire, which further expands his characterization and mania in issues number 689 and 690. This storyline was the first Detective Comics work by Staz Johnson, a British artist who should have done more Batman. Johnson stepped in as a temporary replacement for Graham Nolan, as he was busy creating the graphic novel Batman – Vengeance of Bane 2 – The Redemption. This one-shot was published by the end of summer, and it follows the story arc of Bane as a recovering inmate in Blackgate, where he forges new allies and overcomes his addiction to Venom before escaping prison to find his true origin. The story is primarily focused on Bane, and although there is a brief encounter with Batman, this is hardly a rematch, as they actually work together to stop thugs from spreading Venom in Gotham. The next villain in the spotlight was Mambat, when DC published an Elseworlds miniseries that tells the story of Kirk Langstrom, a scientist who turned himself into a human bat and now lives with his family in the underground caves of the Arizona desert, where he tries to create more creatures like him. In the story, Mambat comes across a deadly plague created by the government, and the federal agents contact Batman to recover it. Though the plague is unleashed to the world, Mambat redeems himself by stopping the disease from spreading. This is an extremely bizarre story, illustrated with grotesque paintings and weird themes, such as mass destruction, genetic manipulation, sexual fantasies, and body horror. Though this is definitely the most unusual Batman story of the year, the art of John Bolton was so striking that it earned him the Eisner Award for Best Painter. Speaking of deadly plagues, the next big villain in the spotlight was Poison Ivy in the Shadow of the Bat Annual, number 3, which takes a look at the first crimes of Ivy in Gotham. Barely one year after Batman began his work in the city, Poison Ivy showed up and used her extensive knowledge in natural toxins as well as her own poisonous chemicals to steal, plunder, and commit all sorts of crimes targeted towards wealthy men. This is one of the first true attempts of giving Poison Ivy a consistent modern characterization. The story presents Ivy as a greedy criminal whose main motivation is her hatred for men. 
her natural body toxins also create hallucinations of her Poison Ivy avatar that was first introduced back in 1992 on the storyline Hothouse from Legends of the Dark Knight. The story also features the strong bond between Ivy and her plants, which was introduced in Batman the Animated Series, and the book has some of the most beautiful renditions of Poison Ivy, as the art of Brian Apthorpe makes her look absolutely gorgeous. The other stories in Shadow of the Bat also feature some super criminals. Issue number 42 is a crossover with The Batman Chronicles number 2 about a rock star turned evil, while issues number 43 and 44 are part of a three part crossover with Catwoman number 26. This epic three chapter story features Batman vs. the Ratcatcher vs. Catwoman vs. Catman a fatal four-way that follows Batman trying to stop the Ratcatcher's most evil and ambitious plan, while Catwoman and Catman find themselves in their own private battle. This is one of the most complex storylines in Shadow of the Bat, and the art by Barry Kitson was very unusual, as it consisted mostly of shapes and colors. If I had to guess why, I would say he wanted to avoid illustrating the most explicit and disgusting scenes featuring hundreds of giant and feral rats bred by the rat catcher. However, Jim Bayland had no issue doing that in the Catwoman chapter of the story. And speaking of which, the Catwoman series saw Selina Kyle involved in a gang war between crime families in Gotham, and also featured a guest rare appearance by Robin in issue number 25. Incidentally, there were groundbreaking changes happening in Robin's own title, as Mike Waringo became the main Robin artist in issue number 19, and by issue number 22 he had established himself as the best Robin artist the series had. His art provided the book with a feeling of youth, with dynamic and striking visuals that are also cute and pretty. The stories feel fast and energetic, and it's definitely thanks to his art because the writer was the same. One of the least successful series during the summer was Legends of the Dark Knight, as they created some of the most experimental comics in issues number 74 and 75, and starting in issue number 76, they began a three-chapter storyline that follows Bruce Wayne after an accident that leaves him in a deep coma. The story then follows Bruce's subconscious mind into the land of the sleep, where he meets with his soulmate and overcomes trials to awaken once again. This is a very sad tale about lost chances and missed opportunities, a story that takes a look at the possibilities that Bruce would have had if he hadn't become Batman, the chance of happiness that was forever denied to him and to his soulmate. Speaking of tragedies, the summer of 95 was also rough for Azrael, as his journey to learn about his past leads him to the ugly truth about his origin, a revelation that leaves Jean-Paul Valley in a semi-catatonic state from which he is unable to recover. This storyline, combined with the first Azrael annual, which tells the story of Jean-Paul's father in the moments that led to his death, make of this season a terrible time for the Angel of Vengeance. While Azrael spent summer in the dumpster, Nightwing had the most defining moment of his modern career when DC Comics published the first Nightwing miniseries. The four-chapter story follows Nightwing back in Gotham, where he reevaluates his life and decides to give up being a vigilante, throwing away his old Nightwing costume. However, when he learns about past events surrounding the mysterious death of his parents, Dick Grayson decides to become Nightwing once again, and Alfred gives him a new and updated version of his outfit, designed by the technical wizard Harold. This is the story that officially reintroduced Nightwing as a permanent member of the Batman family, and it was written by the legendary Danny O'Neill, who worked with artists Brian Stelfreeze and Greg Land in order to redesign the look of Nightwing for the new generation. O'Neill was a trailblazer in the comic book industry, and especially in the Batman mythos, having recently redesigned Batman just the previous year and now, providing Nightwing with the most iconic design that has become a permanent feature of the character. And finally, the summer of 95 saw the ending of one of the best series of the early 90s. The Batman Adventures came to an end after 4 years and 36 issues of outstanding stories that could be enjoyed by Batman fans of all ages. Though the series had been quite successful, things had changed in the DC animated universe, and The Batman Adventures was cancelled in order to start a new and even more ambitious project.
The final five episodes of Batman the Animated Series were released in September of 1995. They were The Terrible Trio, Showdown, Catwalk, A Bullet for Bullock, and The Lion and the Unicorn. A Bullet for Bullock is the most notable for being a very good adaptation of Detective Comics number 651. With the animated series' original run coming to an end, it's no surprise that DC Comics decided to cancel the Batman Adventures. However, the show was still quite popular and would remain so for a few more years thanks to reruns and syndication. DC knew this would be the case and instead of abandoning the idea, they decided to reboot the Batman Adventure series under a new title. In order to capitalize on the second season of the animated series, DC launched the Batman and Robin Adventures, a new title that would feature Paul Dini as the main writer with Ty Templeton as the artist. Their work on the new series was so good that it earned them the Eisner Award for Best Title for Young Readers. Also in September, DC kept going back to the concept of deadly plagues that could devastate mankind. This approach led to the creation of Batman, Brotherhood of the Bat, an Elseworlds story set in the future where Ra's al Ghul has finally achieved his lifelong dream of an Earth cleansed from humans. In the story, Ra's al Ghul is ready to take over a devastated Earth and he chooses Gotham as his base of operations. Using old concepts created by Batman, Rage creates the Brotherhood of the Bat, a group of elite soldiers trained to obey Rage and impose his new world order. The world's only hope is now the son of Talia, a young man called Talent, who is also the son of Bruce Wayne. When Talent learns the truth about his father, he confronts Rage and the Brotherhood of the Bat, restoring the image of Batman in the process. This is an extremely unique, interesting and well-done story, written by Doug Mensch with art from many of the most relevant Batman artists at the time, working together to create one of the best and most exciting Batman Elseworlds. Batman Brotherhood of the Bat was published alongside a special book called Batman Night Gallery, which showcases the unique designs, outfits and places featured in the main story, and all of which were illustrated by the same artist involved. Though Brotherhood of the Bat was a great Elseworlds tale, it was overshadowed by Underworld Unleashed, the big fall event that affected the entire DC Universe. This three-issue storyline saw the devil himself come to Earth in order to claim as many souls as he possibly can. This version of Satan is called Neron, and he goes around the DC Universe bargaining for the souls of the living. Neron offers people to make their greatest desire come true in exchange for their souls, and when he comes to Gotham, Neron offers Batman to bring back Jason Todd, and although the offer is tempting, Batman refuses. Neron couldn't get many souls from the heroes of the DC Universe, but many of the villains were more than glad to give him their souls in exchange for power. Such is the case of the Silver Age Batman villain called the Spellbinder, who made his comeback during Underworld Unleashed. This villain was known for creating cheap visual tricks and illusions to commit crimes, which is why he was always a third-rate criminal. In Underworld Unleashed, Neron offers the Spellbinder the chance to create powerful illusions, and although he refuses, his girlfriend picks up Neron's offer and becomes the second Spellbinder, after killing the original. In the pages of Detective Comics, the new Spellbinder is able to create lifelike hallucinations that warp reality and bend the mind of whoever comes close to her. Neron also brings back Asbats when he gives the bat suit of Azrael to a criminal who wanted revenge in the Azrael title, while Catwoman confronts Gorilla Grodd after the ape made a deal with Neron. Killer Moth also gave away his soul to stop being a second-rate criminal, and Neron transformed him into Sharaxus, a monstrous moth that feeds on humans. It is up to Robin to confront the new Killer Moth, but in the end the monster is stopped by Lockup, a character that was created in Batman the Animated Series and who makes his first comic book appearance in Robin number 24. Also in the Hawkman title, Scarecrow appears as an ally of Neron, without any explanation. Underworld Unleashed also had a special one-shot that showcases the evil presence of Neron during a hellish night in Arkham Asylum, where Batman once again denies Neron the soul of a victim. The book is called Batman, Devil's Asylum, and the whole story happens inside the haunted halls of Arkham. There is only one Batman villain that got superpowers after making a deal with Neron, but then he lost them completely. 
In issue number 68 of Green Lantern, Mr. Freeze had gained ice powers that allowed him to freeze things with his bare hands and survive without his cryosuit. But by the end of the story, he is defeated by Green Lantern and somehow he goes back to normal. There is no good explanation for this and it's most likely because the normal version of Mr. Freeze was appearing at the same time in Batman number 525, a story that is labeled as part of Underworld Unleashed but which has nothing to do with the actual event. Kelly Jones was always a big fan of Mr. Freeze and he wanted to do a story about him, but the Batman editor Denny O'Neill hated the character of Mr. Freeze so much that he had created a moratorium that banned any sort of Mr. Freeze stories. Nevertheless, Kelly Jones insisted and presented Denny O'Neill with a new character design for Mr. Freeze, which O'Neill liked so much that he allowed them to do just one Mr. Freeze story. That's how, in October of 1995, the best Mr. Freeze design was created, featuring the new cryo suit with incorporated freezing guns and a terrific design, which was very appropriate for the horror-oriented Batman series. Speaking of horror, in October DC Comics also published the third Batman Halloween special, following the yearly tradition by writer Jeff Loeb and artist Tim Sale. This Halloween special is called Ghost, and it's a loose adaptation of the classic Charles Dickens story A Christmas Carol, with Bruce Wayne being visited by three ghosts the night before Halloween. This format allowed Jeff Loeb to showcase the complexities of Batman's fears, exploring his traumas and characterization on a deeper level, while Tim Sale created moody and atmospheric illustrations. This is, without a doubt, one of the most excellent Batman stories of all time. The Fall of 95 also featured small developments in the other Batman titles, like the return of Dr. Chandra King solving in the Azrael series, the official debut of the new and modernized Batmobile in Batman number 526, the discovery of one of Bruce Wayne's ancestors in Shadow of the Bat number 45, and the end of the subplot about the Major of Gotham City, where James Gordon steps down and allows Marion Grange to become the new Major of Gotham, who then is viciously attacked by the gruesome killer known as Cornelius Stirk in Shadow of the Bat number 46 and 47. In the meantime, Catwoman became part of a team of expert criminals hired by a mysterious old millionaire in issues number 28 and 29 of her series, and DC also published The Dark Knight Gallery, a book featuring brand new illustrations from some of the best comic book artists in the medium. However, all of these developments were very small compared to another big publication in the fall of 95, when DC and Marvel Comics decided it was time to bring their two most iconic characters together for the first time. Spider-Man and Batman is the first story where these two pop culture icons meet in order to stop the combined forces of Carnage and the Joker. The story was written by J.M. DiMatteis, one of the best Spider-Man writers of all time and a very good Batman and Joker writer as well. On the other hand, the art was done by Mark Bagley, one of the greatest Spider-Man artists and whose style works really well with Batman. The crossover is extremely fun and well done, getting great reviews across the board and becoming a commercial hit almost instantly. The success of the Spider-Man and Batman crossover was just the first step in the creation of one of the most remarkable moments in comic book history. The final month of 1995 saw DC and Marvel working together to publish the first issue of DC vs. Marvel, the crossover to end all crossovers. This story of epic proportions features characters from the Marvel and DC universe transported into each other universes and set up to battle in order to find out which is the best universe. This was every comic book fan's dream come true, and it was only the start of the greatest collaboration that continued throughout 1996. Meanwhile, the holiday spirit took over the Batman comics, with the Christmas special in Legends of the Dark Knight number 79, where Batman starts a heavy manhunt when some random criminals break into Wayne Manor and steal Bruce Wayne's favorite toy, the last Christmas present, given to him by his parents before they died. 
This theme of Batman keeping the memory of his parents alive was also used in the more cheerful holiday special from issue number 3 of the Batman and Robin adventures, which featured the Riddler threatening to expose Batman and Robin's secret identities exactly on Christmas Day. Speaking of the Riddler, the third issue of the Batman Chronicles features the best character study of the Riddler and his psychological need to create puzzles and riddles about his crimes, delivering the best Riddler story of the year. The Batman Chronicles number 3 also reveals for the first time the origin story of Mr. Zaz and features the return of Killer Croc to Gotham after a very short-lived time living in the swamps of Louisiana. And in the final Robin issue of the year, Tim Drake has to face the dangers of gun violence when that problem takes the life of one of his schoolmates in issue number 25. Batman and Robin also made guest appearances in the Green Arrow and Green Lantern titles, where they provide a bit of assistance to the younger versions of each hero. DC Comics closes up the year with a number of graphic novels and miniseries, including Batman – The Ultimate Evil, a book that really tests the limits of what topics can and should be turned into a Batman comic. In this two-part miniseries, Batman dismantles an international organization of pornography and sexual trade of minors. The Ultimate Evil is an adaptation of a novel, published earlier in 1995, but the story is so filthy and disgusting, it made me physically sick. It is not entertaining and although it may be well-intentioned, it's a topic that is far too ingrained in ugly and very real social problems to be a successful comic book of any kind. As a word of advice, stay away from that one. The Elseworlds story Batman – Dark Allegiances was a bit more successful. The story is set during the late 1930s, when America was about to enter World War II. The story features all the usual elements from that setting – the occasional appearance of Hitler, the old-time technology and weird versions of well-known characters like Batman and Catwoman. The story would be absolutely bonkers if it wasn't so utterly boring. One of the most important graphic novels of December was actually Birds of Prey, Black Canary Oracle. In this one-shot, writer Chuck Dixon creates the iconic superhero team known as the Birds of Prey, with Black Canary and Barbara Gordon becoming the founding members of the team. This was the beginning of one of the greatest series that DC Comics has ever had, and it all came from the mind of Chuck Dixon, who was also busy doing another great graphic novel that was published right at the end of the year. This one is called The Joker, Devil's Advocate an oversized deluxe format graphic novel that follows the Joker as he is arrested and finally convicted for a crime that he may not have committed. After all these years of playing around with Batman, it finally happens and the Joker is sentenced to die in the electric chair. His only hope is Batman. But the real question is, should Batman save the Joker? Everyone in Gotham City agrees that the Joker should die. Everybody wants him dead. There is not a single person who would want to save him, except Batman. The Joker Devil's Advocate is one of the best Joker stories of the 90s, and definitely the most underrated Joker story of all time. Not enough people talk about this story, which shows us the most vicious and brutal side of the Joker, while also showcasing Batman's dedication to actual justice, as well as exploring his intimate dynamics with the Clown Prince of Crime. If the Joker was framed for a crime and put on death row, should we just let it slide and use this as an opportunity to finally get rid of him? Uh, it's a criminally underrated story. Uh, it's really a shame that DC didn't reprint this or put it out digitally because it it may not be on the same level as something like the killing joke but it's an excellent excellent joker story that i think everyone should read if you can get your hands on a copy of it i highly recommend it such a great story this book is perhaps the greatest work by chuck dixon and graham nolan one of the best batman creative teams of the 90s and the final graphic novel of the year is league of justice an Elseworlds miniseries that introduces a version of the Justice League that exists in a medieval fantasy world. The Batman version of this story is quite unique. As he wears the actual skin of a giant bat for a cape and cowl, he rides a chariot pulled by giant bats and Alfred is a reanimated zombie. 
the Batman of these story is phenomenal, but the rest of the cast are not so great and the story is all over the place. The ending of League of Justice was published in 1986 and it joins the rest of Batman's stories that were published in December of 1995 and which were finished the following year. These stories include the return of Azrael's original villain Leha over in Azrael No. 13, a Poison Ivy story in Detective Comics No. 693, a Two-Face story in Batman No. 527, and of course, the ending of the iconic DC vs. Marvel crossover, which defined 1996 like no other event in the comic book industry. And so, another year comes to an end in the complete Batman history, and I hope you enjoyed this new format for the series. As we keep moving forward in the history of the Dark Knight, it really gets harder to document all the relevant events that happen during each year. So if you enjoyed this series and you want to help me make more of this, you can join my Patreon and you can also become a channel member. Both Patreons and members get early access to my videos, their names on the credits and the chance to be a part of it. As always, I want to thank all of my patrons and a special shoutout goes to Agustin Rodriguez for becoming the first member of the channel. I am truly grateful for all your support. So, what was your favorite moment in the history of Batman in 1995? Did you learn something you didn't know before? Did this video bring back some memories? Let me know down in the comments and don't forget to like and subscribe for more Batman videos.